right, this is a portion of the program where you ask questions and we make up answers. So, who's going to be first? You, sir. I'm pointing at you. How would loaning work in a 100% reserve banking system? How would loaning work in a 100% banking industry? Um, want to give that a, oh yeah, Walter can't wait. <laughs> um, Murray Rothbard and several others of us favor 100% banking, which means you don't have fractional reserve banking. Uh, fractional reserve banking means you give the bank, uh, uh, let's say um, uh, Hubert is the bank and, and I uh, deposit $100 in, in the Hubert bank. And now Hubert gives me a uh, demand deposit for $100 and I can take that money whenever I want. And then Hubert, the dirty rat, <laughs> turns around and gives Roderick a loan for $90 because he keeps 10 as a, as a reserve. And now Roderick also has a demand deposit for $90. If Roderick and I both show up at the same time, Hubert can't possibly pay this money unless he's got uh, the Fed behind him where he can print up more stuff. The point is that we have an overdetermination of ownership. Roderick and I are each the full owners of $90. Not the partial owners, but the full owners. And you can't really, in the libertarian society, have two people owning 100% of anything. There was this wonderful movie, The Producers, where Zero Mostel went around and <laughs> sold uh, $10,000 worth, uh, not 10,000, 10,000% of a, of a play. This is fraud. Uh, there are people like Selgin and White, who I regard as renegade libertarians, or at least on this issue, I don't think they're libertarian at all. And there is a debate among the Austro-libertarians on that, but I've just given you the, the one-minute version of why I think that uh, fractional reserve banking is fraudulent. It's, uh, it creates the Austrian business cycle. It creates inflation. Uh, whereas 100% uh, backed money is, if, if I give Hubert the $100, uh, he can't lend it out to anyone else any more than if he were a granary. He couldn't lend out granary on, any, on a fractional reserve basis. I the question was how yeah, if I might uh, take a stab at it, uh, because I understood the question a little differently, how would it work in 100% reserves? I think you would have banking split the way they should be. You'd have deposit banking and you'd have lending banking. So for those who would invest their money in a bank that lends money, they would know their money was at risk and they would know that they can't come and get it at any time. Whereas in a fractional reserve bank as it is today, a deposit banking combined with lending bank, a lending bank, um, that distinction isn't made. So bankers lend out money that people can come and get any time, which is what uh, Walter just described. But in a 100% banking, it can certainly take place, and I think it can especially take place in technology where borrowers and lenders should be able to be hooked up the world over in a matter of seconds, capital here should be able to find people who need capital there and not just at the bank down the street and lend out fractional reserves. So I think that's how it will work. I don't think it'll happen through legislation. I think it'll happen through technology. Next. Oh, everybody. Uh, no, everybody understands uh, fractional reserves. As I learned my question, the first one came to understand fractional reserves because of my money's credit. It burned me up. And I just, people, I don't really understand it. And y'all teach a lot of people. I'm just curious, is it 2%? Is it 20%? I don't, um, I'll take a quick stab at it. I have no idea, but I know that most bankers don't understand it. <laughs> Anybody have anything to add? Not many people know what's going on. So, yes, sir. Yes, sir. What are some historical examples that we can do for what a good anarcho capitalist society would look like? Good historical um, examples of anarcho capitalist societies. Do we have any historians here? Iceland, perhaps? Something. Okay. Uh, there's never been a, um, a society of exactly the kind that, uh, uh, that we advocate. But then, you know, 
there's never been a, uh, you know, a perfect example of a, of a minarchist society either. So, but, but what you can do is you can look at historical cases where, where various different uh, mechanisms that we talk about were in place. Maybe nobody had quite the whole package, but every part of it's been tried. So uh, one example people talk about is medieval Iceland. Medieval Iceland may not have been absolutely pure anarchy, but uh, it came pretty close. Uh, there was... Uh, uh, there, uh, you could you could sign up with your, your basically your protection agency was a local chieftain, but you could sign up with with, with a different chieftain without having to change your geographical location. Um, and your chieftain was also the uh, uh, your representative in the legislature, and seats in the legislature could be bought and sold. Problem was there was a legal limit on the on the upper you know number of seats in the legislature, and so there's a legal limit on the number of chieftaincies, and that created a problem. It wasn't really free entry into the market. But in terms of, of a market for rights protection, uh, pretty much uh, they had it. Um, you know, people talking about other cases, medieval Ireland, the, the American Western frontier, in many respects, had, was, uh, was stateless and had a competitive legal system. Um, other examples people want to talk about? Uh, there was an, an article, uh, The Not-So-Wild Wild West in the Journal of Libertarian Studies, of which Roderick was uh, the editor, and it, it gave that as an example. Uh, Joe Peden does stuff on ancient Ireland. David Friedman did stuff on ancient Iceland. Uh, I would quarrel with the question. The, the import of the question is, uh, you say you're in favor of uh, full free enterprise and uh, laissez-faire anarchism. Has there ever been an example of it? No, well then your claim is invalid. We also claim that we want a, a society with no murder and no rape. Has there ever been such a society with no murder and no rape? No. Therefore, we have to retract our desire to have a society with no murder and no rape? No. So just because there's never been a perfect example, and we're on the wrong side of the Garden of Eden for perfection, just because there's never been an example doesn't undermine the claim that it's a good thing. There are many, mother, uh, many, many other examples. The law of the sea merchant, when uh, in the 15th or the 17th century, when uh, somebody from uh, uh, Belgium was trading with somebody from England and they had a dispute, they had admiralty courts and the law of merchant. Uh, the institution of kosher foods is a anarcho-capitalist kind of a thing because th they certify foods uh, without any government approval and people are free to accept it or not. Uh, we live not in a pure anarcho-libertarian state, of course, but there are vestiges of it whenever two people trade anything. Whenever you go to the store and buy a, a newspaper for a buck, that's part of anarcho-capitalism. Um, sometimes you can see kind of seeds of that in completely unexpected places. I went to the Republic of South Africa recently, which is a, almost a socialist state, but because of the failure of the state, there is private protection agencies uh, to the point even that I took a picture of the headquarters of Cape Town Police Department. It's a huge building, high-rise, Cape Town Police Department. And there's a little plug there. It said, protected by ADT. We shoot without warning. <laughs> you go to Disney World and it's very safe. There's no murders and no rapes there. And they got uh, uh, ducks and geese and mice. And if you act obstreperously, you're surrounded by them. And they're all packing heat. And they say, come with me. They've got cameras there. You're very safe there. You go to uh, Audubon Park in New Orleans or uh, 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 Central Park in New York City or any of the big parks, and it's uh, like anarchy. I mean, oh, wait, no, chaos. <laughs> uh, it, it, because when people get murdered there, nobody loses money. There's no weeding out of inefficient management of, of public spaces. Whereas in private spaces, it's pretty safe. This. This place here, this uh, club, is a pretty safe place because if it weren't, they would lose money and, and we would have, uh, they would go broke or they would tend to go broke. If something happens in the streets of Chicago, the, the mayor of Chicago doesn't lose money, nor does the police department. So we have little vestiges of it all over if you look carefully for it. And just one quick last note. Uh, people often point to Somalia as an example of the horrors of, uh, of anarchy, but uh, the question is, what's the relevant comparison? And this has been interesting, some research done, there's an article by Ben Powell and some other people, I forget who the co-authors are, but you can find that online, uh, Somalia after state collapse. And the, um, the point is that if you compare Somalia both with its, the, if you compare stateless Somalia with its earlier state-ridden self, and also if you compare it with 
its neighbors of comparable economic and cultural and political development and so forth, it's, it's uh, safer and more orderly than those places. So what that suggests is that you know, the market always does the best it can with the materials that it's got. So if you've got you know, a very poor country with a horrible history of, of, uh, uh, and stuff, then you know, it can't do as well with it as it could do with another country, but it does better, you know, that, you know, any country will do better under a state than it will. I mean, any country will do better without a state than it would do under a state. Question requiring a short answer. No, a long answer, who cares? Where? Behind the, behind the pole? There's a pole? Oh, okay. How do you feel about open borders as a solution? Open borders as a solution to liberty. So this is the old libertarian um, immigration versus closed border debate. Uh, this will do it for the, uh, that'll be the last question probably we have, but no, I'll go ahead. I think most of us here are open borders up here, aren't we? Uh, we didn't have fair representation of the other side. Um, yeah, so I'm for open borders, but I think others have written about it more, so I might pass it to. Yeah, I'm for open borders, and you know, uh, you can say, well, these people, you know, if we don't have open borders, people are going to come into our country and they're going to vote for more socialism. And that's why we can't let people in across our borders. But if you do that, you're punishing them for a crime before they've committed it and a crime that many of them won't commit at all. So it seems to me under libertarianism, open border, uh, the closed borders are just ruled right out. You have to commit aggression to have a closed border. And so, and, and so it's just, Sure, maybe, maybe we'd have more socialism if we have more immigration, but you can't take that speculation and then use that to deny people their rights. This is a very divisive issue within libertarian circles. Uh, Murray Rothbard changed his mind on that. I have an article where I say Rothbard 1 was correct and Rothbard 2 is incorrect because he switched to the anti-immigration border. Uh, Hans Hoppe, an eminent libertarian theoretician, I would go so far as to say the most eminent libertarian theoretician is wrong on this issue. Ron Paul is wrong on this issue. Um, whereas the four of us, I think, or the five of us uh, are on the other side. To me, the question is, does coming into a country uh, per se violate the non-aggression principle? And as Hubert said, uh, obviously not. And if you want to take a reductio ad absurdum of it, there is this country from which people immigrate, it's called Storkovia. Now, you people think that babies come from, uh, you know, uh, the mother and the father get together. Not so, not so. They come from a country called Storkovia. The stork brings them here. The point I'm trying to make in my ineffable way or my idiotic way is that they are immigrants from this country. And if we're really against immigrants and we want to be logically consistent, we have to stop all babies from being born. Because in 19 years or 18 years, they too might vote about whatever, and they might commit crimes, and God knows what else they'll do. So if, if you want to punish people for their future crimes, well, babies will commit crimes in the future, so we've got to stop all babies. Yeah, and I would add to that, I mean, okay. How do you feel about foreign military marching in to immigrate? Uh... Okay, I'll finish my thought that I was going to say, and then I'll address that one. Um, yeah, I mean, elaborating a little bit on Walter's point, if we're going to... So the anti-immigration people base their anti-immigration policies on the idea of what the people are likely to do, so based on where they come from, based on their national background. So... Think about if we started this with babies, as Walter was saying. Well, you're from this demographic background, so we're going to abort you because we're not, uh, you know, we're not confident that you're going to be supportive enough of libertarian policies. It's, it's just, it's just uh, totally untenable from a libertarian perspective. It's, it's terrible. Yeah, well, I, I, I don't want to shoot people on the border. That would be consistent with this abortion principle. Uh, but from another hand, there's another point of view. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that we can decide this issue. This is this is, was was for a very long time. Well, I think there's two major points of view. One of Hans Hermann Hoppe that if you have a freedom of association, you have a freedom of non-association as well. That means people in this country can decide whether they want to have new more more new people coming from somewhere else or not. So it's one, I think it's, it's pretty, I mean, pretty kind of um, reasonable argument, right? Another open borders, Hayek, for example, he used to say that, that today a lot of people are coming to the United States not in search of 
American dream, not in search of hard work, whatever, but just to go on, on welfare rolls right away. His point was that's not the problem of these people, that's the problem of welfare system. The problem of welfare system. So we are sending these wrong signals and, and we are getting, and, and so that the, the kind of the best Misesian approach would be that to have open borders and then you have people um, immigrating, emigrating and whatnot. So this is, a, this is very, very important. But what I want to kind of, because I am an immigrant myself, I would, I would again would like to reiterate this, and maybe you will think I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed or focused on that, that please keep this country free, because I am already an old person, and I don't want to shop for another defection destination again. <laughs> I think we're talking about peaceful immigrants. We're not talking about invading armies. I think there's a... a relevant difference between an invading army, which is intent on uh, using violence against innocent people, and uh, immigrants who are not I intent on, on doing that. You're really debating the issue. That's the central issue. How do you deal with a foreign military force who may leave the country? If you put that, that's a very good thing to speak. But if you, you're impugning motives of people who are opposed to immigration, that they are they don't like these people, they don't like those people, but they don't want the system of liberty that still hangs on by the threat in this country to be destroyed. So they they are worried about a foreign invasion by effectively a military. And they may be wrong, but that's the true motive. If you want to talk about motives, that is the true motive of Americans who are worried about immigration. If you remove the threat of a foreign invasion by a foreign military that wants to impose totalitarian system, then that's a very different debate. But that is the central issue on the minds of Americans who are concerned about immigration. You are evading the issue if you present it any other way. Well, I don't think I'm in evading the issue. I think that we can make a clear and distinct uh, difference between an invading army and by definition, invasion is a violation of non the non-aggression principle. I think most people are concerned with what Yuri talked about, the welfare or getting uh, hospital care or getting free education or whatever. And the obvious answer to that is get rid of those things and you won't have that problem. Uh, I, I think that, that anyone invading anyone is a violation of the non-aggression principle. But when some people come peacefully and they're not going to invade, they just want to live here or, or live in a... Uh, I travel sometimes from Vancouver to New Orleans, and I go right over the Rocky Mountains, and I tell you, that place is empty. There's just no one there. Now, suppose somebody from China or Mars came in there and started homesteading some land in the middle of, uh, I don't know, uh, Wyoming, in the Rockies. Are they committing, per se, a crime against anyone? I don't see how they are. Now, if they come with bazookas and guns and they start shooting people, well, then they're an invading army and we should stop them. And I, I think, you know, Ron Paul is sometimes accused of not being in favor of defense. I think he's in favor of defense. He would like a very strong, um, uh, what do you call it, coast guard, if I could put words in his mouth. He just doesn't want to have uh, armies in, in every country. Uh, so you have to distinguish between offense and defense. You have to distinguish between peaceful immigration and invading army. And you know, there's that joke, uh, do you know the difference between a bathroom and a living room? Don't come to my house if you don't. <laughs> well, it, <laughs> If you don't know the difference between an invasion and, and peaceful immigration, and you don't know the difference between offense and defense, then I say stay out of political economy, because those are crucial uh, concepts. Next. Yes, sir. Yes, I, I, uh, yeah. um, this is, uh, I hate to continue with that, but there's a second side, another side to that issue, um, I, I had gone from close borders to libertarian open borders, and I'm moving more back to close borders beliefs again because of reading more about Western culture and Dr. Long's blog, Austro Athenian, that kind of love. Um, the founding of Western culture do, does it matter, do we care, if the country is shifting? The Wall Street Journal just said he had. European heritage people are down about 10 percent last decade. The spend is up 24 um, percent. You know, big issues of multiculturalism, non-assimilation um, of the cultures. Is that something that for a viewer, we got to care about? Is it? Are we incrementally changing the nature of this country? 
are we going, are we, there's a frog boiling in the pot and, and it's not jumping out? Are we losing that, that Western culture that created this country? Or do we not even care if we are? If I'd known the name of my blog was going to convert someone to closed borders, I would have chosen a different name. Um, but if you think, you know, if you look at the, you know, the history of this country, uh, and you know, it, it seems to me that, it doesn't seem to me that the, uh, the deterioration of commitment to ideals of liberty has come primarily from immigrants. It seems that it's come from right here in this country, right here from, from people of you know, Western European descent have uh, you know, have been quite you know quite committed to uh, undermining uh, liberty. Um, I don't think that that uh, commitment to liberty is something that's unique to uh, Western culture. What what Western culture ended up with is a certain set of institutions for complex historical reasons. But you can find ideas of liberty in other cultures. Often they just didn't end up with the con with the right institutions to go with them. I mean, I have an article online called Austro Libertarian Themes in in uh, ancient Chinese thought, Confucian thought. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, if we're going to, if you're going to stop people from coming into the country because they might, uh, you know, they might uh, move us in a more statist direction, that's a reason to kick out of the country, you know, everyone who, has, who is uh, already moving us in a more statist direction. Unfortunately, that's the majority. And our prospects of kicking the majority of, of native citizens out of the country, I think, are slim. Others on this? Yeah, I mean, you, if you talk about our European traditions, well, Europe has had that. I mean, before they had immigration, I mean, what did they have in the 20th century? They had half a century of brutal war and then half a century of socialism. Their European tradition didn't save them. So I think it's us spreading the ideas that makes the biggest difference, not, not what happened in the distant past. All right, we got less than five minutes left, and I would urge us to try another topic. Views on working on the black market uh, to um, essentially uh, display our freedoms, right? I guess is that yeah, okay. Yuri Maltsov should be uh, an expert. <laughs> well, I I came from the black market kind of place, yeah, and everything we could get was from black market. There was nothing. On the, on the, I don't know, white market, or there was no white market, it was central plan and black market. The problem with black market is because property rights are blurred in the black market, it's all the time source of violence. People will shoot each other. In the United States, we shoot each other because of illegal drugs market, for example. Uh, and uh, for example, if you go south of here and you will buy something on the abandoned parking lot and you will try it and find out that it's crashed aspirin or choke, not what you wanted, then you cannot return it back for full refund in 30 days. You cannot, cannot call Illinois Office of Consumer Protection, cannot call your lawyer. You can just take a machine gun and enforce property rights and contracts, right? That's what our drug industry is producing 46% of crime in the United States, at least 46% incarceration. In socialist societies, almost everything is prohibited. Not only illegal drugs, everything. Entrepreneurship is illegal. Uh, making market goods is illegal. So everything went there, and so that's why it's, uh, the, the, the uh, Soviet Union became a, a murder capital of the world. So black market is, from one hand, it provides people with something, it's better than no market at all, but from another hand, it's a source of violence in many cases, and then, the idea was, for example, of reformers in Moscow, just legalize the black market and we will have a market economy. But it's very difficult because people operating, entrepreneurs of the black market, they kind of know how to shoot others or how to poison the, the competition, but they don't know much about, uh, about uh, uh, initial public offerings or, or stock market or, or rule of law. So that's, that's why I think that the market should go hand-in-hand hand with the rule of law. 
can be private law. One, one of the uh, most despicable things that the government does is that the FDA will not allow you, if you're dying of cancer and you're on your last legs and the, they've given you a week to live or a month to live, they will not allow you to use an experimental drug because it's not a, yet approved by them. And I think that's heinous, and I think if you can get the experimental drug, you know, you should get it. Another very heinous uh, government regulation that creates black markets is they don't allow markets in used body parts. And people die and have to go on dialysis machines because they can't get a kidney. It's just despicable. If they would allow a market in this, people, we'd be up to our armpits and kidneys to, to uh, screw up a phrase. Uh, we wouldn't have the shortage anymore. We have the shortage because the, the price level is zero. Uh, so if you, can, if you need a kidney and you can't get it and you have to break the law to do it, I think you're justified on libertarian grounds. I mean, uh, the drug market is probably you know, the most, one of the most violent cases of, uh, of a black market. But take something that's a lot, a lot uh, more benign. Take uh, downloading songs. Now, if you, you know, if... If, like uh, most of us up here, you're against intellectual property, you think there's nothing wrong with downloading songs. Now, you could have, you know, there are two ways you could work to be able to get uh, free songs. One is you could lobby the government to try and get copyright laws changed. The other is you could just go and bypass them and download, uh, you know, download stuff yourself. And the second is the black market way. It's the agorist way. And uh, so I think... You know, as I understand agorism, it's a matter of sort of building alternative institutions, alternative practices. Of course, it's risky, sometimes more than others. Um, there are fairly low risk ways of doing some of these things, but it's a matter of building institutions and practices where you bypass the government, uh, get it so that more and more people come to find it natural, uh, and gradually the government loses support, and eventually sort of social power shifts to these market institutions. So, you know, I'm not, so I wouldn't advise people to go out and and uh, you know, get involved in the drug market. Uh, but uh, you know, there are there are other, I think, more promising ways in which uh, in which uh, we're bypassing the state. Anybody over here? Anybody? You, sir. You are the last question of the day. Make it good and make it short. <laughs> yes. Okay, we have the last question of the day. Is there a six-year plan that anybody up here has? And I only have one little thing I would do. If I could do one thing, I would stop withholding from people's paychecks. That is the only... If, if I could do one small thing, if people had to write a check on April 15th, I think it would make all the difference in the world, but i give it to the panel. Okay. Well, I'm going to suggest uh, you know, an agorist approach. Uh, trying to get the government to do something, I've got no, no plan for that. Uh, but um, uh, working with, you know, working with uh, the right on things like homeschooling, working with the left on things like you know, raw food, various, various nonviolent things. You know, there's, the people in the homeschooling movement aren't shooting each other, and people in the raw food industry aren't shooting each other. So no, black markets don't all... You know, and of course, those, those government is backing down more and more from regulating some of those things, like uh, homeschooling. Uh, so, uh, you know, building alternative institutions, getting more and more people involved in seeking things through those uh, institutions rather than through the state, I think that's something that we can start doing right now. And you don't have to wait to convince 51% of people to vote on something. You can just get a smaller number of people voting to put together institutions right now. Very quickly. I agree completely. <laughs> We can't get rid of the withholding tax because the withholding tax was uh, offered, uh, initiated by Mr. Libertarian, Milton Friedman. Right. And therefore, it must be pro-liberty. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, although, to be fair to Milton, he did later recant and apologize for that. But still, you're not going to find Murray Rothbard or anyone like that uh, coming up with that. 
Uh, my uh, suggestion, I notice there's not one single solitary black person in this audience. I've long had this initiative among the black community. I've been on TV on this thing called Our Story, trying to get them to see that the war on drugs is an anti-black law, that young black men are killing each other like flies, that the blacks are disproportionately in jail for victimless crimes, and that this is uh, something they should put on the top of their uh, uh, platform or the top of their agenda. This would certainly be an opening to the left. Instead, what you get when you, when you hear Thomas Sowell or Walter Williams or any of these other black people uh, who are free enterprisers, although they're a little weak on the war, but what the heck, you can't get everything. Uh, they say they're Oreo cookies. You know, they're white on the inside and black on the outside of their Uncle Tom's. Uh, this is a horrible thing, and, and perhaps if we had an initiative to the black community to get them to see the heinousness of this and how it disproportionately affects their community, maybe we can make some uh, progress in six years. I, 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 when I came to the United States, uh, the first thing I published was, um, at that time, they were discussing 500-day plan, how to get out of communism, yes. And I wrote my own massive one-day plan, one-day plan. I don't know whether we need six days, six, six, six days even, not six years, because change should be going overnight. Otherwise, the enemies of change would mobilize themselves. And you cannot just, you cannot gradual change, it should be eschewed in favor of, of dramatic change, overnight change. Look how Soviet Union collapsed. It wasn't collapsing in 500 days. It collapsed overnight. And uh, I would quote a famous uh, conservative, near conservative uh, imperialist, Margaret Thatcher, but she had sometimes very good sense of humor. She said that if, for example, gradual change is never, never works, if we Brits would try to switch from our left-hand driving to right-hand driving and do it, say, in 100 days, sending the first week only big trucks to the right. <laughs> so, so that would not that would not work. I think that we we should um, yes. And, and speaking about plans, yes, uh, uh, you, the the last kind of thing about Mr. Gorbachev. Can you imagine? He really believed that planning system works. That we just didn't have a good plan. Can you imagine that central planning works? And I see so many of my colleagues in American academia saying exactly the same, that central planning works, which has never had a good plan. And I think that in, in a decentralized society, in the society of individual self-ownership, we should promote what we believe in and try to make change as soon as it possibly can occur. <laughs> <laughs>